Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode here at the Damage Report with me, John Iderola, still under lockdown, and I feel like I'll be saying that every morning for the rest of my life, because we're surrounded by people who seem dead set on doing everything necessary to keep this virus going strong into 2021 and beyond. But anyway, uh, today we have a Wednesday. Wednesdays are big news days, and big news days require big news discussants. Like JR Jackson. It's <laughs> going, JR. What's up? Hey, you know what? Um, I understand uh, I was not here last Wednesday, but the problem was, first of all, it was totally out of my control. Last Wednesday was not a big news Wednesday, so I just had to check out. It's just, it doesn't, <laughs> you know, if, if the brand doesn't match, I just cannot continue down yeah. that road. That's right? true. Yeah, and the crazy thing is, you are so tapped into how big of a news day any one Wednesday will be that you knew the night before it wouldn't be one. <laughs> But anyway, um, don't you worry. <laughs> it was we a frantic you text. Under the bus. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, good. And we're glad to have, have done, you here. I would have done the same. Yeah, I'm sure. Everyone in the chat, please hit the like button. I know there was some propaganda being spread in the comments before we got here that you should withhold your like until we show our faces. You don't need to do that. It's nice to show up and have likes already be here. Um, but you can also spread the stream, let more people know that this is live, because YouTube feels no requirement to actually notify people that we are going live. So feel free to let everyone know that it is time for Dragon Squad to assemble. And um, through the course of this episode, we're going to have quite a bit to talk about. New projections on how many could possibly die as this pandemic continues. Um, some of the political implications of that. Uh, we've got the future of schools, we've got a SCOTUS decision, and um, there's been this national conversation about race uh, for a few months now, and everybody's been waiting to find out, what does Peter Navarro think? <laughs> so we're going to have that finally. And then if there's time to close out the show, we've got a few excerpts uh, of Mary Trump's book. So we'll be talking about that. And maybe, just maybe, Sprocket. So, anyway, we'll, oh. we'll see if we can get that. Uh, but anyway, we'll also be responding to your tweets at hashtag TDR Live, your comments, your tweeches, and uh, your super chats as well. So, with that, why don't we jump into this thing, JR? I'm done. Okay. I know that we all want to imagine that this pandemic couldn't possibly last much longer. It couldn't possibly take that many more people from us. But the most recent projections are saying that it indeed will. The University of Washington has extended its projection of how many people are likely to die from coronavirus in the U.S. between now and November 1st, predicting at least 208,255 deaths by then, based on the current scenario. So that is the bad news. We will have a little bit of good news in a moment, but let's just acknowledge that if that is true, that that means... Not even by the end of the year, let alone the end of the pandemic, but just before the general election, for instance, we're looking at 80,000 more confirmed official deaths from coronavirus, according to the most recent models. Yes. Okay. So, and you're going to get to, like you said, just some potentially good news involved with this, but you'll get to that. But the idea is that this is what's projected. So this number is going to be used just the same way the original numbers were used, um, that some didn't get to that point, potentially because of lockdown procedures, because of quarantine things, because of shutting down of certain businesses. All those things happened, and whatever numbers were proposed to have happened didn't necessarily get there. Others, they were proposed to be lower, exploded. So it's all based in our habits and how we respond. Like this is something that's still within the control of human beings to do something about mm -hmm. and shape the way it'll look. Now, the way it's, per way it's portrayed by people who don't want to deal with it primarily people in administration, is to say it's not really in your control at all. It's just okay. I feel like it's more empowering. And Trump talks about things being positive. And, and uh, uh, Rand Paul said to Dr. Fauci last week, I wish you were more optimistic. Hey, we can be optimistic. We can be positive when you do things that lead us to a place of optimism and a place of positivity. It's not like it's out of our control. Mm -hmm. That's what's so frustrating about this. And then so when things have gone with numbers, didn't get to the point where we expected it. It's because of our actions and because of the way we responded to things. And the response then isn't, good job, you guys. We kept numbers below what we were what we were projecting because of our actions. Instead, it's, you didn't have to do all that stuff. Yeah. And it just seems like so counterproductive. Usually when someone does something the right way, you go, good job, you did the right way. Look at the victory you had. 
Instead, it's, look, you did things the right way, but let's not think that was the right way. Let's go back to the wrong way. It's a shame that we'll run the country like this. Exactly. Look, there is no need for fatalism about this thing. I know that the White House's new narrative is just, just live with it. Just whatever happens, happens. And if you get it, you get it. And if not, then that's good. No. We don't need to do that. There are definitely things we can do. And what if some of those things that we could do uh, could save many lives and were also the easiest things to imagine? What if we were blessed enough in these dark times to have that? Well, that's the good news in this model. So let's turn to that. They say that if 95% of the population wears a mask while in public, the number of deaths would drop to approximately 162,808. I'm not a mathematician, but that's like 40 to 50,000 deaths less. And all it takes is us wearing masks, which is fully within our control. We can all wear them. They can be made available to us. They're already readily available for the most part, at least in informal ways, not N95s or anything like that. But the government, if they wanted to, could spend a little bit of money, a drop in the bucket for our military budget to make sure that we all have a supply for the, till the end of our days, basically. And in so doing, could save forty to 50,000 lives. Which, by the way, means another 30,000 would still die in the next few months. Another tragedy on top of the tragedies that we're already experiencing. But think about it. A Vietnam death toll, less people would die if we just put on masks. It's so simple. No reason to stick our heads in the sand, to give up, to surrender, to lay down. We don't have to do any of that. We can make this one small change, and we can save so many lives. Yeah, I, I guess the, the problem then is convincing enough people of that very simple fact. It's just, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm at, a, I'm at a, a, a dead end here with the best way to appeal to people. Because Fox News even did it with Trump, because he's the leading proponent of this. Uh, they go, well, by the way, Mr. Trump, he wasn't even on air. I think it was Kilmeade or Ducey, one of them was saying because he was talking indirectly to Trump. He goes, if you want to get things reopened, if you want the economy to come back, because we all want that, maybe if you just say we wear masks, it'll be more readily available to allow people to do so. Like It's like he has to tell, tell him, okay, I see you don't give a damn about public health. Maybe since you're only talking about the economy and how you think that's going to help you get reelected, let's, let's, let's use it in that lens. Now. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. And it still isn't working. Like you have to find a way to like you have to have the baby eat his peas. Like, okay, Donnie, there's only three more peas left. If you do it, I promise you're gonna grow up <laughs> strong and tall. Like you have to give him a different reason besides no. Listen, little kid, you're gonna eat the damn peas. Yeah, yeah. You you need you need some incentive more than save thousands of American lives and make yourself look way less bad. Do you want to hit 200,000 deaths while you're still president? I assume you don't on some level. Well, here's how we can avoid it. Um, and uh, let me give you just a little bit more information. Uh, the current model that we're talking about, that's the University of Washington, the IHME uh, model, includes forecasts that anticipate the reimposition of strong social distancing mandates when deaths per day reach a level of 8 per 1 million people combined with widespread mask adoption versus an approach that takes no preventive action. For instance, deaths could be reduced just in Florida, just over the next few months, by over 6,000. And so th this model, this apocalyptic model, is still assuming that we're going to have some of these things imposed again nationally. But they're still resisting that. Like, hypothetically, it could end up being worse than this apocalyptic projection that we're seeing right now. Yeah, well, let me see. <laughs> Exactly. I have no faith. I have no faith anymore. Actually, I, you know, let's, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I lied. I never had faith. I, I didn't. I no. I, I did not a lot. I knew that Trump was going to lie and be xenophobic and all of that, but I didn't think he would just let this many people die. And I, I know I've, I've admitted that a thousand times over the past hundred plus days, but I, I just still can't imagine. You get surprised more and more by the the things that would be allowed and have been. Taken. The actions that have been taken are lack of actions that have been taken. Yeah. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, 
the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Projections are saying that uh, a significant number of additional people could die by the end of this pandemic, even before we get to election day, which would seem like if you're the incumbent, that's scary. But that is not going to stop Trump's representatives on the media from trying to preemptively take victory laps. What is surprising is that a member of Fox's Fox and Friends crew actually called them out on it. Wants to go in there and talk about all the accomplishments he's he's uh, done in his first term and how he's made people's lives better. It answers the age old question. Are you better off now than you were before? And the answer mm. undoubtedly is yes. And that strikes it, true Hogan, in really? and, and across this country. But, but with the pandemic now, the you know, you know, the, the growth is not there. You know, the unemployment still 11 percent. So you can't really say you're better off than you were three years ago because of, at the very least, the pandemic. So you can't really oh. say that, right? No, no, absolutely. Of course you can say that, because listen, this global pandemic uh, hit all of us, not just here in this country, but across the world. That Look, Kilmeade, I try to give them credit whenever I can. Here, I think he deserves it. I forget exactly what, but he said something else that was absolutely crazy this morning. But there, he called him out in real time and said, look, come on, you can't say that. And he said the pandemic, but he also said the growth isn't there. He listed a couple of reasons why you can't just say you're objectively better off than you were. No one in 2020 is better off than they were. And so I'm glad that he at least called him out on that. Yeah. I don't know if he continued further on and say, okay, that next excuse you just gave me, Hogan, is more BS because it's obvious that we're not better off. How about you ask over 100, 130,000, 25, 30,000 people that are dead, are their lives better off? How much better is death than life? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you don't give a damn about their lives. You don't care about how their families have been affected from the death of them. Are their families' lives better off? What is better off? You know, that, that line of you're better off since since I've come in office, as every president does when they're trying to run free election, it's just a throwaway line. It's just mm-hmm. the assumption of, oh, your life is better off. Did, we, did you go through the list of things that make my life better off since you've been in office? And then say it's a wide swath of people in the country have the same uh, indication? Because 130,000 people... Uh, knew enough people that those people's lives are affected from now on negatively. So I'm not sure if you're just only talking about Wall Street gains or the corporations that received money from you or the backhanded deals or the power shifts that have happened in Washington, people getting different jobs that benefit themselves. But that's their level of are you doing better? It has nothing to do with regular Americans. Oh, my God, the highlighting of how much they don't give a damn about regular Americans is stark, man. Exactly. It's it's the 130,000 dead, uh, basically everyone who knows them. It's the other people who have been sick but didn't die. We don't talk about them very often, but there's a lot of them and their families, yeah. especially those who are going to be suffering the health impacts of having had coronavirus for the rest of their lives. It's the millions and millions of people who have lost their jobs. It's the businesses that have been damaged. And again, some of that was always going to happen, but at every step of the way, Trump has done whatever is necessary to make it worse. He has bought this thing. He didn't have to own it, but he went out of his way to buy it. And Hogan Gidley, it's not just that he's pretending that 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 we shouldn't care about that stuff. It's that he is continuing the administration's stance of not taking any responsibility and expressing no empathy to imply, no, 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 everybody is better off, is telling all of the people watching that that know that they're not you're wrong. 
you're wrong or you're lying or you've been fooled by someone. Sure, you lost your business or you lost your house or you lost a loved one, but you're wrong. You're actually better off. Stop thinking that you're not. And that's that's their strategy. It's been their strategy since Donald Trump said, I take no responsibility. Yeah. And they're they're sticking with it. See, it works. It's, it's the age-old pop political rule is tell the people what they think rather than hearing what they think and then pulling them. I mean, you, they'll go on TV all the time and say, the American people want this, 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 and that. And those, this, this, and that are things that you want and you're projecting on American people as your reason for doing what you're doing. And it's just not the case. Yeah, and um, I, I didn't I didn't play more of the video, but there are two other things that he said that they will always say now. Whenever, you, whenever they are forced to talk about the number who have died, because they'll never bring it up, but when they're forced to, they'll say one of two things. One is, hey, there was a projection uh, that two million people would die, and they didn't, so Trump saved two million people, which we predicted when that number originally came out that they would someday use that. No matter how many people die, they will always compare it favorably to the absolute maximum number who could have died. And I will remind people again, and I don't know why this isn't talked about constantly, Trump wanted to do nothing. He wanted it to wash over America and kill those millions of people. That was his strategy that he had to be repeatedly talked out of. So at that point, you don't get to spike the football on saving millions of lives when your instinct was to let those people die so that we don't have to shut down the economy. At that point, you get absolutely no credit. And the other thing they do is they say uh, Trump shut down uh, the planes from China. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, when I say they've done nothing to stop this thing, some right wingers will say, well, that's not fair. They've done plenty. And then I'll say, OK, they shut down the planes and they'll be like, no, they did more than that. And I'll respond to them by saying, then why is that the only thing that Trump's representatives ever acknowledge he did? This is Hogan Gidley. He's with Trump, and that's the only thing he can list. And again, think about how pointless a thing that is to bring up. That once coronavirus was already here, because he didn't care about it, he didn't take the warning seriously, it was already rampaging across America, after that, he shuts down some flights from China. <laughs> At that point, it's spreading internally. We don't have to worry about people getting off a plane from Wuhan at that point. We have to worry about people getting off planes from Tallahassee to Indianapolis. It was already spreading. And he had literally months to respond to it and just kept saying, hey, I shut down the flights. I shut down the flights. Why isn't that enough? I shut down the flights as the cases continued to go up and the death toll skyrocketed. Yeah. No credit. The, object the objective was not to stop the spread in America because he doesn't know how that works. No, it's, it's not that he ignored it and was being, well, he kind of was being vicious and ignored it. That did happen. But the whole thing about the push that, oh, I stopped flights from China. His thought is, I need to make it seem like this has nothing to do with us in America. He, there's this winning thing that he's got when it comes to, every time he brings it up, you notice. It's, this country's doing that, that country's doing this, this country's doing that, and we're better than him in all ways. And those are lies. So... <laughs> The whole thing about stopping flights from Wuhan is like, yeah, I stopped Chinese flights. That's all I needed to do. It's already here, bro. So now from that point on, there's no more plans. There's zero plans anymore. Because how do I stop it here? Oh, I don't know. Just go back to work. This is too much work for me to think of something. I actually put together a coalition of people. And I accidentally did put together a coalition of a few people that are telling us the truth. But I don't like them because those truths don't match up with my political uh, objectives. Yeah. Donald Trump said about five weeks ago that he was going to pull the United States out of the World Health Organization. And many people responded with, in this economy or in this pandemic? Um, and it seemed like potentially it could be just one of his, you know, bluffs, one of his bits of bluster. Every time he says something crazy, everyone says, stop focusing on it. Why are you focusing on it? He hasn't actually done it. He just tweeted. Unfortunately, in a not insignificant percentage of cases, he then goes on to actually do it. And in this case, he did. He's apparently going to pull us out. The departure would take effect sometime next year should the United States meet established conditions of giving a one-year notice and fulfilling its current financial obligations. So that is technically what is required for us to actually pull out of the WHO. You have to give a year's notice, and you have to make sure that you're up to date on your payments. And I ask you, faithful listeners... Do you think that Donald Trump will feel bound by either of those things? That if after a year, uh, we still owe them a ton of money, and I'll give you updated numbers in just a second, do, do you think he's going to be like, well, oh, I guess we got to stay in? I don't think so. I think he's still going to pull us out. And it's just so absurd 
It's so absurd. It is just part of his ploy to make this entire thing, the entire conversation about the pandemic, about the supposed actions of the Chinese government, and to get people to focus on that. That's it. And he believes that attacking the WHO is a way to get people to focus on China as opposed to the United States. Is it going to work? I don't know. For, for much of his base, it seems like it already did. But anyway, I told you I would tell you about the, the financial obligations, so let's let's turn to that. The U.S. played a central role in creating the WHO back in 1948 and has since been one of its largest sources of financial support. That's a crime that Trump won't allow to continue. The biennial budget for the WHO is about $6 billion. Think about that in comparison to our military budget, let alone the world uh, military budgets. In 2019, the last year for which figures were available, the United States contributed about $553 million. However, the U.S. currently owes the WHO more than $200 million in dues for 2020. And so again, I will ask, do you think that Trump is going to feel bound to stay in the WHO if he doesn't pay off that money? <laughs> for, I guess the first question is, will he pay off that money? And um, this, again, goes to back to many things about his character, his background, who he is. Has he ever paid off a debt, you know, mm-hmm. after an event is over or after he feels like they've done the service for him and he's gotten what he's gotten from them? He has a track record for not paying things. Again, these are the types of issues, and I say it almost every time we talk about it. During the campaign in 2016, we find out this guy's moral shortcomings, his uh, his business acumen, which sucks, and all of this <laughs> affects the way that he does things. So when they said, oh, you guys are nitpicking, who cares if he hasn't paid off some vendor? Well, first of all, if the vendor does, and anyone else that may want to work with him should care about that because I thought he's an economic guy, and that's how uh, you want to move money around. If you someone, if you uh, contract someone to do a job and you don't pay them, uh, that's illegal. But um, after you go through all this, now this is it's transitioned in the way that we run our country. Leave debts that we've promised and actually help us Leave them to the side because this president doesn't want to do it, just because he doesn't want to. So it's damaging the name of America. It's damaging our standing in the world. It's damaging the way we may protect citizens because Republicans do like to say the primary goal or the primary objective of a president is to protect its citizens. 130,000 of them are dead. There's more things the WHO does than just something with this pandemic. It has existed since forever. So you're, you're eliminating those, uh, those assistance, the assistance that they can provide for other things that are very helpful to move yeah. the country or the world forward. But, you know, we don't care about the world. Uh, well, except perhaps China. Because, again, this is all about Trump getting people to focus not on those numbers that you just cited, but on China. So remember he said this back when he was originally talking about taking us out of the WHO. The world is now suffering as a result of the malfeasance of the Chinese government. Countless lives have been taken and profound economic hardship has been inflicted all around the globe. Um, And so, look, I I hate the the constant demonizing of China to get him to not focus on domestic uh, issues when Trump does it. I don't like it when Biden does it in his ads either. Does that mean that China didn't do anything wrong? I feel quite certain that they have done things wrong. But I am going to focus more on my own government. We can't control what China does, doesn't do, reports, doesn't report. But we can control what our government does, theoretically, if you're in our government. And that is the massive failure that I want to make sure that is on people's minds as we go into a general election. And anyway, I thought it was an interesting bit of timing that uh, yesterday... Uh, the WHO had uh, uh, like a meeting about the pandemic, and this is what the director general for it uh, said. Said the outbreak is accelerating, and we've clearly not reached the peak of the pandemic. More than six months in, the case for national unity and global solidarity is undeniable. We cannot afford any divisions. That was yesterday, the day before Trump announces that the U.S. is going to be pulling out, when the U.S., of course, leads in deaths internationally. And while many countries and in fact regions have said we're not going to allow U.S. citizens in, for those who don't, I mean, if they do allow us in, they're likely going to be, they're going to be endangering their citizens. Like we're pulling out of assisting the WHO and controlling this, and we're also probably going to be contributing to it uh, in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually the same logic that Trump uses for saying he was victorious in getting ahead of this by cutting off flights from China. Well, people are cutting off flights from the United States now. So we're that entity that, you're, that you've been talking about that you want to protect your citizens from by cutting off flights. Why is that the case now? It's still China's fault. 
it's still China's fault for what you've not done in this country to get us to move us forward. I mean, it really it's as simple as giving a decent message, backing up professionals that that have told people the best way to go forward. It's not even that hard. Yeah. He actually actively went against what we need to do to make things better. It's like he's actually act. He's he's, <laughs> he's living this this life of hey. Anything I can do to make things worse and blame someone else for. It's like a liar. Like, why do you have to lie mm-hmm. and make your make life harder on yourself so you have to clean up after each lie? It's easy to just be like, you know what? I messed that up. Let's start better by going forward now. If you say that in March and it's now July, people would have not forgotten, but they would have probably forgiven you for the screw-ups you had mm-hmm. right before that point. Yeah. No, I'm glad that you brought the line because it's, it's like Bernie always says, Trump is a pathological liar. Because it's not just he's willing to lie, he wants to lie. He likes deceiving people. He likes manipulating people. And he and still some people, like Tucker Carlson, as you'll see, they seem to like the fact that they have the ability to get people to not defend themselves against coronavirus. They seem to like the ability to manipulate people into endangering themselves. They get they get off on it. It's some sort of superiority complex that if I can get you to risk your life and possibly die... The power I have, the power of a god, basically. Sometimes a thought pops into Trump's head and he just has to scream about it. And that's why not long ago, he tweeted, Schools must open in the fall! <laughs> and I don't, I don't have sources in the White House, but I have a feeling that no one around him was expecting that that would suddenly become a focus of Trump. Schools must open in the fall! Um, and so they took a day to sort of workshop it a bit. And they came up with a slightly better version of the argument with Trump tweeting uh, this morning, in Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and many other countries, schools are open with no problems. The Dems think it would be bad for them politically if US schools open before the November election, but it is important for the children and families. Make it all funding if not open. So I'm gonna have some numbers there, but JR, uh, I'm very glad that you're on because you have a child. And so this conversation about whether schools should be opened, what teachers think about it, what parents think about it, I I don't really have a dog in that fight, but you do have a dog or a son in that fight. (laughs) So what do you think about all this? Yeah, it's um, – every school district obviously is different. uh, It's different sizing. You know, kids are different ages, all that stuff. What type of interactions they're going to have to have. There's some kids that have special needs. Uh, There's some kids that need to be in closer proximity. Uh, kids are going to touch each other. They're going to be somewhat near each other. They're, so I, I was on my kids' school board meeting a couple weeks ago, and they went through this for so very long about how they can potentially find a way to set up a situation where kids can come in and parents can be comfortable enough sending their kids there. Because as we know, that's why schools get on everyone for your kids' attendance like crazy, even when they're really young. When you're in high school, it's one of those things where, like, you got to watch your kid because in case they want to skip a class or whatever like that. But when you're in elementary school and your kid misses a day, you know it because they're at home sick or something and you don't report it, they are on your ass. Yeah. Like, you're getting calls. You're getting automated calls. You're getting calls from the office. And the next day they go, you still have this uh, this absence that you never accounted for. And they send you letters home. Yeah, on November 20th, this happened. And then on January 7th, you missed this. So they're on it because there's money behind it. So it's extremely important for, for, for your kid to be there. This is very basic stuff for every parent. And everyone knows this, obviously. But this, I, I just want to explain it out fully because this is what our president doesn't get and Ron DeSantis doesn't get. Is Now, you're sending kids back to school because you want to make sure that the money's flowing back through again and getting paid and everything is just normal. That's the idea. But what's the point of that if the parents don't want to do it? They have to convince enough parents to feel safe sending their children, these people that they like. Trump doesn't understand that either. Um, to a place that's safe so when they come back home it doesn't become a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's all about money. And the number two thing, I'm sorry, the number one thing is Trump revealed it himself. He goes, these Democrats just want to keep kids from going to school because they want to stop this perception that everything is great before the November elections because, of course, it all comes back to getting elected. He needs kids back in school so things can look as normal as possible so he can get reelected because he thinks that's the key Mm because everything else he's tried has not worked. Yeah. I agree. It's all about, and and that's, by the way, why, and we're, we're going to have more on this, their whole thing is schools have to be open. Damn those Democrats for thinking about this purely politically when it is the clearest projection ever. 
Um, but before we go on more about that, I, I did a little bit of research. And, um, you know, Trump in his tweet said, hey, if they can do it in Germany, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, schools are open with no problems, why not us? And so I decided to look into it and see if maybe there were anything, even a small thing, different uh, between the U.S. and some of these countries. So I looked at how coronavirus is going on in Germany, and it looks like that. No huge second part of the first wave. There are still cases, but they seem to be doing a pretty good job in Germany of controlling it. We move on now to Denmark. Again, there was one rough day where it looks like three or four days of reporting was compiled into one, but uh, overall very low numbers. And by the way, in Germany, they still had like a thousand cases a day. Um, That's like 20 cases a day in Denmark. Okay, so that's less than one classroom of cases. In Denmark. In Norway, I mean, what is that? What is that? Three cases a day? Something like that? And by the way, did you know in Norway, there are 10 people in Norway? That is the entire population. So <laughs> maybe these are reasons, you know, that, that would matter in terms of what can be normalized. Now, Sweden, to be fair, does have more coronavirus. Interestingly, Sweden is the country that in the beginning of this pandemic, the right was holding up as, let's just do what Sweden is doing. Sweden is doing so good, and they're not locking down and all doing all these things that everyone else is doing. But in comparison to the other countries in the region, they're doing way worse. Okay? Now, he lumps them in there to make it sound better, I guess. But no, Sweden is doing way better than us, by the way. Way better than us. But they're doing worse than the other countries in the region. All of this is necessary to, to think about and understand before deciding if schools could be opened up here, because this is what our coronavirus caseload looks like. Jesus. It is way higher than it was before. Now, yes, if we had been doing universal testing at the beginning, the numbers would have been even scarier at the beginning, likely, but we are going in the exact wrong direction, and you have to think about that before deciding, no, we can send creatures into a small room with each other These creatures, by the way, love only a couple of things. Pokemon and spreading disease. That's pretty much it. (laughs) Because the thing is, the kids could have it, and maybe they're asymptomatic. And then they can spread it to other kids, and maybe those kids will be asymptomatic. Maybe the kids will be okay, although kids have died from coronavirus. Maybe the kids will be okay. But what about the teachers? What about the parents when they come home? I mean, what, are the kids going to come home and then not touch an adult for the next two weeks? That's not how it works. Yeah, it's... it's, uh... Not thinking about the the way it spreads and how it can connect with parents, teachers, staff, adult staff at the school, all that stuff. It's just irresponsible. And you no, know, it's it's not it's not even it's not even not realizing it's literally overlooking it. It's actively ignoring that potential part of this. And by the way, if these other countries that Trump is tweeting about uh, have gone back to school and everything is just grand, tell us how and why then. Tell us what they did to get to that point. There's no backing to any statement that's ever made. Like if you as a president of the United States, if you make a statement, you should say, can we put that tweet up again? So if you make a statement where it says, look, Germany, Sweden, or what do you say, Germany, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and many other countries, which ones? Be specific. You're an adult. Mm-hmm. Schools are open with mm-hmm. no uh, problems because of uh, the, the uh, edited version to do due to their actions on, due to this implementation, due to this. What are the reasons that they do that they got these schools open again? What is the reason? Why don't someone ask him that? Yeah. Because if, if we're looking to emulate them, let's go ahead and get the full picture. What are they doing then? We're not asking that question? Because I thought we wanted to get kids back into school. Yeah. And if people are against you, the way you win an argument is you give some facts. But you don't have any of those. Yeah. It's like... It's like if you had a bunch of athletes all spraying their ankles on the same day, and some of them, like, healed it. They put ice on it, they kept off of it, and and another person was just, like, painfully hopping around all day. And, like, at the end of the week, you just say, now all of you go play sports again. How do you think that's going to (laughs) go? You didn't have time to heal. You didn't take it seriously. Your ankle's still effed up. And then the ankle, it's all messed up. Then you start telling yourself, well, look, the rest of the players, they're back to playing. Why can't I? Yeah. Because you didn't do the same thing Why they did to prepare. Why can't I? Ow. Please. Put me back in. <laughs> like, no, you idiot. You have to lay down for a little while. <laughs> I've sprained my ankle many times. You got to take it seriously. <laughs> God, it's so stupid. Donald Trump wants kids to go back to school. 
I consider that to be a fairly radical position, considering that he's not going to do anything to protect them. But theoretically, localities will. States and cities might say that there has to be limited class size, social distancing, and things like that to try to limit the spread of coronavirus if kids go back to school. And now enter Tucker Carlson, who is not going to take winning for an answer. So he is going to talk about the debate we're having over how to reopen schools in an extremely fundament fundamentally Tucker Carlson dishonest sort of way. So take a look at this. Today, the president announced his support for opening the country's schools this fall. It seems like a pretty obvious position, but suddenly it's not. Many people violently disagree with it for reasons that still are not clear, but definitely are not rational. So look, I wanted to stop there I'm because- I'm really glad you did. But you go for, feel free, no, you go for- Okay. Um, John, you have a better point, go. Well, we'll see. So um, right there, that is Tucker Carlson. That is everything about Tucker Carlson right there. Uh, Trump wants to go back to school should be an obvious position. Sure, if you only listen to him and have the same objectives as him and don't listen to the concerns of anyone else. Um, there are other people who are violently disagreeing. By disagreeing, there's no violence. But that's not extreme enough to get people fired up to hate the other side. So you have to pretend that they're violent. And he says, for reasons that aren't clear... Why? Are you are you having some of those people on to answer that question? No, you're choosing not to. And it's obvious why. The pandemic is why. But this is this is Tucker Carlson rule number one. Ignorance is strength. I'll pretend that I can't understand their side so that you don't have to try to understand their side. Sure, I could have a representative of their side on. I choose not to. And even in the case when he's pretending not understand what Black Lives Matter is about, even when it is being shouted from the rooftops for literally years, still pretend that a reasonable person could never understand what their position is. But we do know this. It's violent and it's irrational. That is yeah. so Tucker Carlson right there. Yeah. You connect all these violent, angry, anti-words with, with the argument that you're going against. It's the idea of a straw man. We know how it goes. And you build up this whole thing that you knock down with no facts whatsoever. So uh, the reason you talked about maybe he could have a representative of this side on, he's done things like that. And I get the idea that potentially people don't want to go on his show anymore because all he does is talk over them. And then when they give a point, then he goes, I, I, I sure have to, have to, have to yeah, whatever, yeah. and moves on as if that's, that's a rebuttal to the argument. To have this stupid fake chuckle and then tell them what they're saying because he knows his audience has been conditioned now to just listen and, and, and follow him as if he's this like majestic leader. So you talk fast enough and you make these declarative statements that are based nowhere in fact mm -hmm. and then move on to the next step. Yeah. And people go, oh, yeah, he must be right because he told me it's ridiculous. And he says there's no viable reason why people would believe this. Did you just say it. It doesn't make it true. I've said it before on the show. A friend from college. Chris, he does this, and it works. Yeah. I'm the only person that always was like, Chris, that's BS, bro. Where'd you get that from? And he's like, laughs. and goes, <sniffs> he's like, I know you're in. I know you you got me. Yeah. But this is fun. It's just, it's they do think it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. For reasons we can't understand, no one knows why uh, they don't want the kids to spread coronavirus. I can't hear you. For reasons that no one understands, I don't understand it, and none of my viewers have to understand it. Uh, but he does go on because every story needs a villain, and so he has identified one. So kids should go to school. That's the new position. Now, you may have thought this was a debate that we settled conclusively in the 19th century when we banned eight-year-olds from working in factories and sent them to school. Parents are certainly on board with that. They want their kids back in the classroom in September. Every poll shows that. Most kids and most teachers probably feel the same way. So who is opposed to opening schools? Take a guess. The teachers' unions. The teachers' unions' position on every question is always the same. They would like less work, no accountability, and much more pay. At least one chapter of the American Federation of Teachers is planning to go on strike if they have to work this fall. So many administrators and school districts have no choice but to obey their demands. Okay, so, and that's another classic uh, Tucker Carlson thing. Um, mm. Your enemies make demands. We just make rational points. We just have a thing that they want. They have demands. You must obey. I'm saying it has to happen the way I want. Schools have to open, but that's not a demand. And they don't have to obey. <laughs> but when you say, well, what about the virus? You're making demands. Don't just shove it down my mouth. That's a very classic Tucker thing.
Yeah. Um, the idea that didn't we didn't we settle this whole kids should be in school thing back in the 1920s? What was that during the coronavirus pandemic? Oh, so there's some context that you're purposely leaving out there. Think about how intellectually dishonest that is to pretend that what the people are saying today is kids shouldn't ever be in school. It's not about the pandemic. They should just never go to school once again. Is that what you have heard the opposition saying? Because I sure as hell haven't. Nope. He hasn't heard any of it. Well, if he's heard it, he definitely ignored it. Uh, again, it's, 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 um, it's, act, it's, it's a, what's the best word? He's not creative, but he's, I guess he's, he's a bit talented. He's talented at manipulating the, uh, the argument when you're not arguing with anyone. And obviously he's reading it, so this is all a, a, a pre-thought out plan. This is just the way it works. Uh, people will watch people on TV or audiences will watch Tucker on TV and think that he's coming up with these amazing points that are well thought out and he's just spewing them off the top of his head. No, this guy is reading a prepared statement and if it goes 25 minutes, every word of it was prepared. Yep. There's a plan behind every word, the way it's said and then how it's, uh, the, how it's said and portrayed to the audience. This is all a manipulation. So him not knowing the answer to these questions or saying, like, who knows? It's purposeful. I always have to remind people that. This is a script. Yep. It's like an actor. It's a script. So if you see Tom Cruise say something about kids okay. going back to school and he's arguing against something, this is the same thing. Tucker's reading a script. I don't yeah. know how much of it he wrote, but he's reading it. Yeah. Um, so all of that was extreme, extremely intellectually dishonest mainly, but it gets worse than that. Uh, Tucker Carlson isn't just pushing for kids to go back to school. That's not enough. He wants them to go back, and he wants there to be literally no safety precautions whatsoever to protect their health, the health of their teachers, others who work in the schools, or the people those kids will go home and then interact with. Here is what he said on last night's show. Many schools that do plan to reopen will do so under a series of restrictions that have no basis of any kind in science. It's a kind of bizarre health theater. Students will be kept six feet apart. Everyone will have to wear a mask. Class size will be limited. In some schools, there will be scheduled bathroom breaks, et cetera, et cetera. No sports. Just like Ben Shapiro, he's really worried about the lack of sports. Anyway, um, yeah, no, uh, I don't need to exaggerate what he said because he said it right there. It is July 8th, and he's still saying that staying apart from each other and wearing masks has no basis in science. That's Tucker Carlson, guy with a platform that reaches millions of people every night, makes millions of dollars a year, extremely influential, has somehow accrued a reputation for being a critical thinker, someone who thinks outside of the box, not just a dogmatic pundit, is still telling people, as we rocket past 130,000 deaths, that wearing masks is unscientific. It's an unscientific solution. Again, all this is planned. And you, you, can, you can see all of the evidence to the contrary, but all they have to do is say, that's crazy. Why would you think such a thing? That doesn't make any sense in reality. Laura Ingram does it, Hannity does it, they all do it. So it's it's a it's an onslaught of misinformation, and we are we've seen the studies about Fox News viewers and how they're woefully misinformed on things that everyone else knows the reality and truth about because they've been held hostage by their brains on this one channel, and it's just spoon fed lies, mm -hmm. and then it becomes a, a weird fact that now leading up to our president carries out. It's sad, bro. <laughs> it's so it's so sad, but honestly. We have to engage with it. I'm going to do it more. As much as, as watching his stuff and reading the transcripts enrages me, we have to because he is very influential and we have to fight the, the normalizing of Tucker Carlson. He's one of, like Sean Hannity is dishonest, but it's so obvious. Tucker Carlson has write-ups in magazines about him as like this person who straddles the divide and stuff. No, he's just a liar who spreads white supremacy. That's it. He teaches his audience to not consider what the other side is thinking, to view literally everything through an us versus them lens, us being white individuals versus everything else. That's how you should see literally everything. That's it. That's really it. And and think for a second about how radical the video we just showed you is. It's obviously radical, but it's also radical in a way that's not quite obvious. Because he was saying schools that are opening are going to be doing these things. What does he want? He wants schools to open. He's acknowledging that they're opening, but that isn't enough for him. 
He wants them to open and he wants them to do nothing to protect the kids. He wants, he's not like more funding he doesn't want. He wants them to strip away the limited protections that will be here right now. He has already won, but that isn't enough. He wants to win and he wants people to be exposed to the virus. So Trump is saying we need to reopen so that things look normal, but that isn't good enough for their movement. Because masks keep it in your mind that there is a pandemic that you need to be protected against. We need to ignore all of that, no matter the cost. No matter how many teachers or lunch ladies or janitors or parents or grandparents die, that is how radical Tucker Carlson's position is. And that's just last night. <laughs> it's just one night. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's the way it's going to be. That there's the the main objective is this sense of normalcy, and as you just said. It goes back to the election. We can't win an election if people are in school safely or doing it in these shifts or whatever ideas are being floated. If we have any kind of protection or, or, or worry about what can happen and look to avoid it, that's a negative for these guys. Think about that again. Protecting yourself is a negative for the Republican Party. God. I mean, I wish they felt that same way about uh, 25 guns in someone's house and worry that some minority is going to bust through the door every night. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, de- they, they're, they, don't, they don't have a lack of worry about that. They're definitely worried about that, but they're not worried about actual numbers of people dying every day in this country yeah. based off of exactly what they're proposing people to not do. The, the magic trick that Fox plays is to get people to not worry about the things that are actually ruining their life, actually killing them, and get them to focus on things that are fantastical. Yeah. Effectively, worry about the orcs. Fictional creatures, that's what's going to kill you. Not the fact that the, you haven't, you're haven't, you not making any more money than you would have been like 30 years ago. The economy hasn't actually benefited working people like you. You don't have access to health insurance. Your kids are probably screwed in all these different ways. Don't think about that. Caravan. There's a caravan coming. <laughs> caravan. Not oh. yet. Let's get a little bit closer to the election. Then a caravan will be coming. Ugh. That's, the, that's um, the alchemy of Fox News. So, John, are these orcs, are they from the Guardians of the Galaxy too? I need, I just need to know. I mean, because then I haven't Lord seen it. Are the orcs in the – I need the audience to let me know. I don't know if orcs are canonical to the Marvel universe, but I will find out. Don't don't think I won't. Anyway, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Brian Finizzi sent in a super chat saying Tucker Carlson is so intellectually dishonest that it is infuriating, hundred percent, but in fairly predictable ways. He has a certain number of tricks that he uses that have to be called out. We cannot allow him to be normalized, and I am able to call him out. Because of one very important characteristic about me. I don't want to go on his show. That's all it takes. <laughs> if you want to go on his show, you won't call him out. But I don't want to go on his show. I got no interest in being on his show. <laughs> so I can I can call him out for what he's doing. A lot of uh, big Supreme Court decisions coming out recently. T- this morning, there was a doozy. The Supreme Court on Wednesday upheld a Trump administration regulation that lets employers with religious or moral objections limit women's access to birth control coverage under the Affordable Care Act. As a consequence of this, it is going to affect a lot of women. About 70,000 to 126,000 women could lose contraceptive coverage from their employers, according to government estimates. And the vote, by the way, was not one of these very common five fours that we've seen recently. It was 7-2 with just Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor dissenting. So, I mean, are are we shocked? I don't know. I I would have thought it would have been closer. Um, But still, this is is the priority, is making it more difficult for women to exercise control over their own reproductive... And this is over reproductive system. This is contraceptives and all that stuff. This isn't... As they've all been pushing so hard, just abortions. No, this is much broader, much broader. (laughs) So um, your religious uh, 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 beliefs and your system of beliefs there will keep you as an employer from uh, providing enough health care for your female employee to get contraceptive services because you should care about that. Hey, if your religious beliefs have you worried about sex or contraception or what women do with their time when they're not at work, like, wh- why are you thinking about it? I thought you are disgusted by it. Just leave it alone then. If you don't want to know what's happening, don't pay attention to it. But instead, it's, I want to know about your sex life. What was it Pat Robertson said that years ago? Because mm-hmm. I asked this lady, so how's your sex life? And he was like, giddy to find out. <sighs> so the people that, that talk about how they don't 
their religious beliefs keep them from wanting to deal in this. It's actually their religious beliefs have suppressed them enough that now what they really want to do is dig as deep as possible because there's this weird thing about controlling people's sexuality and sex lives and contraceptive uh, 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 health and their reproductive health as much as they can. Again, mm-hmm. I said it before about people who are liars. It's so much extra trouble. Hey, yeah. just do the job that you're doing. Provide your people with health care and leave them the hell alone. It's so much easier. How about you focus on your business instead of somebody's private parts? Exactly. Yeah, and, and some people are sort of alluding to this in the chat. Um, it's always interesting when you find seemingly contradictory things in a political ideology. So imagine... If one of your values was, we have to stop every abortion, and one of your other values was, I don't want you to have access to birth control, let me think about how those two things combine, and what the likely outcome of removing one will be on your path to stopping all abortions from happening in the other. But it's an absolutist philosophy, and the absolute is their desire for total control over women's bodies. Um, that hasn't changed uh, in a very long time. It seemed, in some ways, that we were moving in the right direction. I mean, back in March of 2010, Barack Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, which includes a section that requires coverage of preventive health services and screenings for women. The next year, the Obama administration required employers and insurers to provide women with coverage at no cost for all methods of contraception approved by the uh, the FDA. So, had a good run. A good run for a lot of women, and uh, now they're starting to pick away at it. And, yeah, I mean, uh, it, you know, it's 70 to 126,000 women with this ruling. What are they doing the next one? Maybe they'll aim a little bit higher. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a perception thing. It's obvious that they actually don't give a damn about uh, uh, women's right to choose or being pro-life because we've seen countless times every one of these people who are very pro-life secretly with their mistresses and their babies out of wedlock and their bastard children, what they end up doing is carrying out the same things that they push people against doing. We've seen it. So they'll, they'll, they'll voice their opposition to abortion, they'll voice their opposition to uh, infidelity, and they do all these things. Those types of, th- those types of things are reserved for me. Mm-hmm. Those options are just for me and my mistress, because they think everybody has mistresses, and any time a woman chooses to do what the hell she wants with her body, that it must be them uh, doing something nefarious and dirty and being little filthy women. We've seen how they describe women in these types of situations because that's how they see them. So uh, they, they, they need this to be this look of them having this, this, uh, these morals. Mm-hmm. And then behind the closed doors, they're doing exactly the opposite. But, you know, I yeah. guess it just doesn't matter. There was a great tweet this morning, by the way, uh, from uh, Adrian Lawrence, who said, I'm surprised more men aren't up in arms about SCOTUS's contraceptive ruling today, seeing as y'all are always bitching about wearing condoms. Hundred percent, hundred percent. God. Um, well, as long as they get the access to the uh, to exactly, yeah, that's the thing. It's not like you know, it's not like the the people that they're involved with couldn't get access to it. It's the people who need the financial assistance won't be able to. Again, it's always all of these limitations on women's reproductive rights are always going to be massively skewed towards those with the least resources. If you have enough resources, you can travel anywhere you want, you can get whatever you want. Um, the less money you have, the easier it is to restrict them. We are now months into possibly the longest extended national conversation about race in America uh, that I can experience, with the potential consequences of actual change, significant things like reforming the police and all of that. But our government is not likely to want to be a big part of that conversation. And perhaps it's for the best, because we have a video that we're going to show you of White House Trade Representative Peter Navarro talking about what he thinks about the conversation around race. It, that, that none of this race, racial divisions have made any sense to me. And, you know, I, I'm a Californian. We, we, don't, we don't see race out there. So, you know, it's like uh, I live my life in, in, in a race-blind world, and, and I just, it troubles me. It, it troubles me. That, that we have so much of this discussion uh, when, in fact, we've got real, real problems in, in this country. That- in charge it- of international trade for the U.S. He went to the same line that I mentioned earlier. He starts telling us what the American people want to care about. 
Mm-hmm. Just based strictly off of his own opinion. What the American people don't want to talk about this. What the American people want to talk about, based on who? Did you talk to anyone that told you that? Mm-hmm. Was it Jim in o- Ohio that told you? No, just just say it. American people don't want to talk about this. Yeah, we do. That's why you see everybody in the streets. That's why you see even people who hate racial equality or, or civil rights to be pursued. They're talking about it. People who are against it are talking about it. So I think everyone cares. Every night on Fox, uh, all these guys are talking about it, but they're talking about it in nefarious ways, talking about how horrible it is. So we care. It's just you're trying to get us to stop talking about it from the side of doing something about it. That's the problem. So also, by the way, California is this uh, racially blind state. (laughs) You know, people have this weird thing. I'm not sure which part of the state Peter Navarro lives in, but... um, People always assume when somebody says California, they just think it's L.A. You know, so I'm going to Cali. If you're in Ohio and you say, I'm going to go to Cali, does anyone ever say, oh, you're going to Sacramento, huh? <laughs> no, no one assumes that. So there's this colorblind L.A. First of all, it's nowhere near, number one. There's 39.5 million people mm-hmm. as of 2019 living in the state of California. Do you think nearly 40 million people that there's no, there's racial, like, blindness going on nothing ever happens we see videos of this all the time and those are just very small instances we're talking about sy- uh, systematic like type of race racism hold on jr that happens here Be- so you're you're asserting that in your view someone could live in california and be racist <laughs> it's but, crazy but, hold place. on i looked up where he lives or at least lived up until recently i can't 100 percent assert so i'm gonna tell you the place and you tell me whether you're going to apologize for asserting that he could be racist. Mm -hmm. Orange County. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Uh, Maybe. For people that don't know, Orange County is south of LA. It is the conservative and Trump hubs. It's not completely, of course, but that's where it'll be. It's more uh, likely that you'll run across Trump supporters. Um, also, you go to the middle of nowhere, you go east into the state of California, further northeast, you know, the more remote areas. Everywhere yeah. you get into those areas, this the state is a state. It's not just a city. And by the way, the city is also not free and clear of it. Let's just keep it real. It's So, it, you know, I don't know if he thought about that answer before he gave it, but talking about how he's from California, therefore he doesn't know what racism is. Yeah. I really no. thought it was going to be like Watts. I really did when I Googled it, but no, uh, uh, OC, Laguna Beach, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the the, re- the really old white guy saying that he lives in a race blind world. Like, how many? What's the point of that? That's a luxury. Statement? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And then and because you're 100 percent right. But then he even demonstrated how it's a luxury in the same breath saying. So then all this talk about race when we have real problems in the country. So that's what race blindness means to him. That I pretend that any problem that has to do with race doesn't exist, or if it does, it's not a real problem. Real problems are for people who don't have racial problems, other people. In the same way that in Tucker Carlson last night, he said, we have to fight to preserve our nation and heritage against these two women of color. We, who's the we? I'm not going to say who the we is, but we have to do it because they are taking away our nation in <laughs> heritage. Isn't it nice to be able you to use it. vague language but communicate so much? Yep. So clearly. It's very easy how it goes. I- I've said this before, too, is uh, just the argument about just the acknowledgement of racism. Because we also had times, I think I put together a mashup the other day where Tucker had said, um, we had a black president, hello. So we already know how stupid that argument is. Yeah. Uh, but the, 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 the perception of these people, their position of, of privilege and expectations of being the guardians and gatekeepers of whether or not something is racist or not is already a form of supremacy. So in order for us to do anything about the racism problems in our country, we have to convince you that they exist yep. before we take action. Why are you the gatekeeper for that? Why is it that you, you are the this superior being that we have to convince that racism exists when you're the racist. Yep. Why should I listen to you? Yeah. You are the bad guy. Like your thought is like, no, we're not gonna do anything about this. You somehow convince me that racism is a real thing. Well, shut up, get out of my face, then you're a nobody to me. <laughs> what are you here for? 
like, like so there's there that's that's just the way our, our whole society is run. Hey, convince them that we can do something that something's a problem so we can finally do something. They're the problem. Why would they agree to that? Kaya says, Tucker Carlson on Tammy Duckworth, indisputably hate America, that is BS. So pissed, I'm still hot, need a viral storm till he's fired. Yeah, I um I didn't put it on the show today, but I did a lot of thinking about it last night. And I decided I didn't want to just because it made me so angry. It is in the same way that one of the other clips is, it's everything that is Tucker Carlson and the right. The idea that this guy who has never and has never had to be brave about literally anything is going to say that someone who lost multiple legs in service to the country is a coward. And they're a coward because despite them losing their legs, they won't come on and debate me. Because rule number two of Tucker Carlson is there is no form of bravery greater than bickering with a pundit. Honestly, Ben Shapiro, all of them. This is the height of bravery is brand building exercises where you yell at a pundit and the pundit yells back at you. Even knowing that they're going to be operating in total bad faith. He said in the segment last night, uh, my first question to be to her would be, how can you lead this country when you hate it? So you can sort of understand why she didn't want to debate him. What's the point when that's the caliber of intellectual honesty he will bring to a debate? No, I just got so mad about the whole thing. And not just about him. He's going to be the white supremacist that he is. It's that the media apparatus allows him to seem to be something else that I find completely unacceptable and I'm going to continue to fight against. I got so mad watching that clip, reading the transcript. It is so manipulative, so fake. This air, this elitist air thinks that he can talk about bravery. No, he can't. I can't. I'm a stupid internet pundit too, okay? I don't get to call people cowards, okay, that have lost legs in the military. And again, like, he gets to just besmirch her as hating America, she's a coward, whatever, it's obvious racist dog whistles and all of that. You remember how they reacted when Pete Davidson made a joke about, uh, uh, what's his face, the, the, um, the, the vet Republican, how they freaked out and made him apologize because it was unacceptable to criticize a soldier who had been injured while serving the country. That was their stance, a very specific stance. But not specific, because it doesn't last. As soon as it's the opposite way, someone who was injured far more grievously, no, you can totally write them off. Like Pete Davidson, I don't remember the joke that he made, but it was a joke. This is Tucker Carlson making a specific judgment that she is a coward and she hates this country. Far worse criticism against someone far more injured that is unacceptable. That's the level of intellectual honesty. And again, all they want to do is debate. And so she asked for him to apologize in advance for the ridiculous things he had said. And she probably wanted that because she knew what was coming when she went on the show with him, if she were to. Questions like, how are you going to lead this country when you hate this country? It is talking about ideas and debate and logic and all of that while never holding to any of it. Use that as the wrapping on the present, but the present is vicious, fact-free attacks. That's all it is. Hypocrisy, obviously on display. That's what it is. That's what the right is. That's what Tucker Carlson is. And all of the up-and-coming right-wing commentators follow that model. That is the Ben Shapiro model. Say the word logic. It's Dave Rubin. Say the word ideas. Have none. Don't actually hold the logic. Don't feel restricted to make rational, logical arguments. Just use the words a lot. The set dressing. You can't necessarily trust that your government is going to be responsible in the next crisis that hits. It seems even more important that you be prepared. And that is why we are very excited to welcome onto the show Judith Matloff, the author of How to Drag a Body and Other Safety Tips You Hope to Never Need. Welcome to the Damage Report. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, your book just came out. Uh, I have to imagine you could not have imagined how timely it would be when you decided to write it. No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the publisher HarperCollins moved up publication by about a month um, because I was getting so inundated with queries and you know, you know, requests to talk and whatnot that we, they just like rushed it forward. Uh, but no, I did not anticipate this. 
And so um, talk to me about the, the process of the coming up with a concept for the book. Uh, what, what was your goal? Yeah, well, the thing is, I was a foreign correspondent for um, more than 20, 30 years working in crisis zones, the former Soviet Union, Latin America, particularly Mexico, Africa, etc. And so a big part of my job was supervising people who are going into dangerous situations or trying to supervise myself. Now, when I started reporting 40 years ago, we had no safety protocols. So the first time I covered a conflict, I didn't even know that you're not supposed to run towards gunfire. And I didn't know anything about you know where you hide or I mean, like stuff which should be common sense, but it actually isn't the first time you face it. And while I was doing all this and I was getting death threats and friends were being kidnapped and raped and whatnot, I kept thinking, you know, we really need to do this in a smarter way. And so when I came back to the United States 20 years ago and began teaching at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, I began to incorporate safety protocols and safety training into my training. And then what happened, because you know everybody talked, then I suddenly started getting requests to do training in the Middle East and Africa and again, Latin America with journalists who were working in very dangerous situations. Now, so here I am in New York and it's, you know, people know what I do. And so my sister who's a social worker would be asking me for safety tips for when she goes down to Puerto Rico with her family. And then the plumber down the street is asking me about hurricanes, like what does he do to secure his building? And then a friend whose daughter was going to Jordan on her junior year abroad wanted to know, was it really safe? What precautions should the girl take? And then, you know, as I'm feeling all these queries, I was thinking, why don't I just put it in a book, you know, and let more people exactly. find out about this? That's how it happened. Exactly, and and as we, as we pointed out, certainly seems timely. But one of the things that we found most interesting about the book was that your definition of crisis isn't just necessarily the thing that leaps to mind. You're you're in an earthquake, a volcano has just gone off. That you define it a little bit more broadly, and you prepare people for crises beyond just the most obvious sort. Right, uh, one of them would be a pandemic, obviously, <laughs> which is definitely in everybody's book a, a crisis. But it's also preparing people to travel safely and to take precautions to think about what might happen when you are traveling. Uh, definitely, I'm very, very concerned about digital safety and protecting oneself against doxing, against cyber harassment that goes beyond just what a kid would go through cyberbullying, but really, really serious stuff that can damage your reputation and even endanger you. And another thing, you know, which I'm very, very concerned about is gender safety mm-hmm. for people who are targeted because of their gender or their sexual orientation and are are in a um, at risk of sexual harassment as well as assault. Exactly, and and you can of course have interactions of those things. The you know online safety can be even more necessary for women who are targeted in a lot of ways more violently and sexually than, than men. Um, and so that that's really one of the things we found most interesting is that, that that you really do want to prepare people for a wide range of crises and make sure that they're that they're taking their personal safety. Uh, very seriously. There, there was one, there was a QA that you did about the book where you listed um, the five most important things that, that people need to have on hand in case of a number of different uh, disasters that could potentially happen. Uh, I know that you probably don't want to give away everything, but could you walk us through a few of those perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to give away everything, but I'd be on your show for about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> but the essentials are everybody should have a medical kit. And more importantly, everybody should know how to use it. I think everyone, and I have a chapter on this, should know how to do emergency first aid. We should all know how to stop bleeding. Let's say, you know, look at look at what happened with um, the Boston Marathon bombing. People's lives were sa- saved because bystanders knew how to staunch bleeding before the first uh, responders could come. So you should have a medical kit that would have burn ointments, that would have tourniquets, that would have splints, that would have basic medications that you would need um, for uh, at least a month, I would say. And what I have in my medical kit, I always have three different types of antibiotics. One would be topical for skin, another one would be respiratory, another one would be for the stomach. And doctors will usually very happily uh, prescribe these for you. We also have EpiPens in our medical kit. Um, We really have anything that would happen in 
in a disaster. We also have Ziploc bags. Um, if a finger gets cut off when you're cooking or if you're like sawing a tree or something, you want to put the finger in a Ziploc bag. Little known fact, don't put it on ice, it's not an oyster. So there's that. <laughs> um, there's I did not medical. know that actually. Yeah, I'm well, read the book, there you go. Yeah, it's not a, yeah, do not put a finger, a, a severed finger on ice. Um, and then your medical kit these days should have two weeks of supplies of gloves, wipes, and masks. You always want spare masks because you never know if something's gonna happen to the one or two masks you have. Okay, that's A. Another one is an emergency, what's called an emergency NOAA radio. This is a hand cranked radio uh, through which um, FEMA and local authorities can issue emergency alerts. And the beauty of being hand cranked is you don't need a traditional electrical power source, nor do you need batteries. And these things are, you know, they're really, really small. You can get one like this, you order them off of Home Depot, they're not very expensive. And they are your lifeline in case there is a natural disaster or another type of catastrophe. You know, let's say there's a nuclear attack. I mean, I don't want to start freaking people out, but <laughs> this would be the way you would hear. Um, the other thing which I think is really, really important is that you should make co copies of all your important important documents, every single important document. Your insurance, both home and health, your car insurance, all your licenses, your credit cards, a birth certificate, marriage certificate, death certificate, bank accounts, financial accounts. Just have everything in this one folder in a, in a waterproof package. Because let's say you've got to get out of Dodge really quickly and you, you need to evacuate, it's all right there. You don't need to be rushing around the house trying to figure out where everything is. Another thing that I think everybody needs is um, a go-to bag. The medical kit and the documents are in it, but a go-to bag would have, let's say, enough clothing, um, snacks and whatnot to get you through two weeks. Again, you know, this is a bag that I always keep packed. And as a matter of fact, I always keep it packed even before I go on a regular trip, be it a business trip or a pleasure trip. I just got in the habit when I was a war correspondent, I would get a call at like three in the morning, like go to Burundi, there's a coup. And the bag was always packed. And it's really, really handy because that way when you travel, you don't have to worry about where's my passport, where's my vaccination card, you know, what am I gonna wear? You just have it all planned out and it's always packed. So I have one for the spring and one for you know one for for warm weather, one for cold weather. Um, another thing which I always have in the house is a um, is a supply of batteries, cash. I think a month's supply of cash, and um, I always have a month's supply of food, non perishable food. Um, and all these items came so came so in handy for me and my household. When COVID happened, because I live in New York City, which was the epicenter of the pandemic. And what happened was I was upstate in upstate New York at a writer's residency. Our teenage son was in, in college in California and my husband was on a business trip in Europe. So when the pandemic hit New York, none of us were actually here. So by the time we all converged back home, you know, the grocery stores were empty of everything that everybody was panic buying. But we didn't need to worry because we already had everything in the basement. So let, let's turn now to the current pandemic because it, it would seem, you know, based on both your international experience, the the you know all the information that went into the book, um, and just this conversation that we're having right now, that you would be better equipped. For the you know the, the beginning of a disaster of this sort, than a lot of people. So when when you hear the initial rumblings about coronavirus and it starts to spread throughout Asia and then eventually hits the U.S., did you feel better prepared? How did how did your absolutely. experience and your research? So yeah, you, you absolutely. Did. The first thing my husband and I did, and again, you know, he was in Europe, I was in upstate New York. We communicated immediately and said this, you know, this is going to hit the fan. And you know, what do we have in the house? He had already thought about this and had already upped some of the supplies in the house. And then, you know, we already had telemedicine, but we anticipated that that was going to be a factor. So we made sure that everybody knew everybody's codes in terms of telemedicine and whatnot. One thing that we did prepare at that point was updating our will. 
our will was a little mm-hmm. bit out of date. We thought, you know, we're of that age and that demographic where something might happen. We really don't want to stick our kid who's 19 with, you know, trying to figure out like, you know, the will. We got in touch with the executor of the will and said, you know, Sarah, just want to let you know this is where everything is. We told our son where all the important documents were. So, you know, did it make us less anxious? Um, I mean, we were worried about a pandemic, but we also did feel uh, calmer than if we had not yeah. made these preparations. Yeah, yeah, and as you said, you were in perhaps the hardest hit location on Earth, and in terms of deaths, um, you, you talked there about panic buying, and and you gave us a list of some of the things that that it would be wise for people to prep and and have. We know that many people responded to you know the initial calls for lockdowns in the U.S. by Going and buying a year long supply of toilet paper specifically are, and, and I know that some people are, they're doing their best. You know, they're worried, yeah. they don't know how to respond, they haven't read the book yet. Yeah. Are there other things that people get wrong about preparing for these sorts of diseases that they invest in the wrong things? I would say that's the primary one, and I'm really mystified. I mean, I understand we all want clean butts, but you know, there is water in the house. <laughs> Uh, and and it's largely a respiratory disease. I was really kind of puzzled by that because I've been in other crisis areas, and that's not usually what people stock up on. They usually stock up on food. Um, I think for the most part, the foods that people were buying, uh, you know, lentils, canned tomatoes, that all made sense. But it was the toilet paper that really, really flummoxed me. Yeah. I, and I, I have no, I, you know, some psychologist could write a PhD, you know, or a book about <laughs> why this is. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it's happening, and it, it literally took up until the last few weeks for in my region for it to just be expected that you could go and buy more. Um, and I, I know one other aspect of of your discussions about this topic includes um, being able to understand and identify the stages of different disasters. And so I, I'm curious, the disaster that we're in right now. How would you rate it in terms of which stage it's in and and how that should influence the way a person continues to prepare? I think it's thoroughly geographically dependent. I mean, I'm in New York right now, it seems like they've gotten it pretty much under control. I predict as soon as kids go back to college, we're gonna have a very, very bad second wave. But other parts of the country, you know, they're already getting their second wave and other parts of like in upstate New York, where I was during my writer's residency, you know, it was virtually untouched. So I think it's it's hard to generalize mm-hmm. because it, it really varies on where you are geographically and also the role that the local authorities have taken. I mean, I think Governor Cuomo handled this very, very well. I can't say the same for our federal government and other governors. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that that I've noticed about the prep is some of it, you know, I guess would be free aside from time. Some of it having, you know, a month's supply of food, a month's supply of cash, hypothetically, could be costly. Do yes. you think that either city, state, or the federal government should be providing the aid necessary for people who are going to be hardest hit by this, that are economically least well off, to be able to prepare in, in some of the ways that that you've talked about? Hundred percent, yes. Absolutely, and what happened here in New York is um, community groups and NGOs filled the gap to a certain extent, and that was very challenging. It's very, very challenging, and I do worry about what's ahead. I mean, we have very inadequate health care uh, for most people in this country. We have, um, as you, you know, people are more hard hit financially now than they were before, yeah. and I do worry about, uh, you know, what. What lack of preparation and help is being given to people? I'm very, very concerned about it. Exactly, and um, you know, uh, we've been going through this one crisis. There are the potential crises of evictions and foreclosures and things like that coming. So, uh, hopefully, people will be prepared uh, for those as well. Uh, the book is How to Drag a Body and Other Safety Tips You Hope to Never Need: Survival Tricks for Hacking Hurricanes and Hazards Life Might Throw at You. Judith Matloff, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.